to announce today that we are launching an initiative under the title An Open Letter to America and China from an Arab friend on the UN Day for Tolerance, November 16. I want to start first by two quotations from two great leaders. It is not whether can any of us imagine better, but rather can we do all better? The dogmas of the quiet past are inadequate to the stormy present. We must disenthrall ourselves and then we shall save our country. Fellow citizens, we cannot escape history. We shall nobly save or meanly lose the last best chance of hope on earth. Those are the words of the great leader, President Abraham Lincoln, in a message to the Congress one month prior to the signing of the Emancipation Proclamation. Another great leader said, we should embrace the vision of a community with a shared future in which everyone is bound together. And we must make the right choice, a choice worthy of the people's trust and of our times, and build a new type of international relations and a community with a shared future for mankind. Together, we can make the world a better place for everyone. So did the Chinese president Xi Jinping speak at the United Nations General Assembly on September 2020. The time has come for America to disenthrall itself once again and rededicate itself to the first principles of American greatness, the greatest of which is tolerance and for which the need is not just urgent, but existential. The coronavirus pandemic has threatened the world and the most important question America faces is whether in the post-coronavirus order, securities and nations will still have the confidence to govern themselves because in the words of Henry Kissinger, failure could set the world on fire. And the fire has actually started, literally, and not just in American forests, but in her cities. China's great cultural revolution taught us that. In due course, America will be back and will win the struggle it is going through. Moving beyond my previous concerns that the US and China may be headed for war, I am advocating in the aftermath of the US presidential election that the two nations now begin jointly to articulate their shareable interests with the rest of the world. To assure the good future all nations deserve, we must turn our attention to promoting resilience. Developing resilience, increasing equity around the world, and encouraging our youth to build a sustainable future. It is time to break the change of the contemporary crisis and see our way to a better future. With 40% of the world population under the age of 25, youth are not the future, they are the present. It is their future 
that is at stake. And we must help to empower them to meet the global challenges of the 21st century, of which coronavirus pandemic is only the first to come. I do believe in the America that made my dreams as a young man come true. At the age of 10, I was made a refugee to the Lebanese village of Ghazia as a result of the war of 1948. The United Nations, with the vital U.S. funding, provided me as a distinguished student with a merit scholarship that provided me with an American education in Beirut. It is that American education that propelled me to where I am today, at the helm of a global organization with over 100 offices worldwide headquartered in the Middle East. The American dream is not restricted to America. As a Palestinian, I know firsthand the impact and value of the United States because of the opportunities it has provided for strivers like me. America was open, giving, and kind to me, and I owe her much of my success. In many respects, I am an American ambassador of goodwill. It is with this intimate and personal understanding of the generative power of American tolerance that I ask the Chinese leadership and the Chinese people to continue their support for an enduring global partnership with America. This global partnership will take time to establish. But for the love of humanity, it must be done with thoughtfulness and patience. Indeed, this is what I have already been doing. With great pride, I received a medal from President Xi Jinping for promoting Arab-Chinese relations received the Chinese Confucius Institute Award for Talal Abu Ghazali Confucius Center as the best center in the world and established our technology industry center in China as well as serving as the Chinese visa center in Jordan supporting the Chinese embassy and many more. Throughout our many decades of business relationship and friendships, China proved to be reliable, fair, and honorable. I owe China a great gratitude. In many respects, I'm also a Chinese ambassador of goodwill. In this spirit, I am initiating a one-year-long virtual global partnership summit on November 16 of this month on the United Nations designated International Day of Tolerance. This initiative is in line with the principles of the UN Global Compact founded by UN Secretary General Kofi Annan as chairman and myself as co-chair, and which I continued to co-chair with UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon. The date of this event is also the 10th anniversary of the Global Challenges Forum 
foundation in Geneva, of which I am founder. Together with my co-founder, Dr. Walter Chrisman, we are issuing a global partnership declaration and integrating on 16th of November at the website www.uschinatolerance.com a platform to host and manage the global engagement process. The Virtual Global Partnership Summit will serve for one year as a facilitating partner inviting leaders of all nations, international organizations, global corporations, foundations, and indeed global citizens everywhere in the world to join in the process of establishing a new global partnership for the 21st century. More than ever, in this hyper-connected world, the local is global and the global is local. Challenges in one region have ripple effects across the globe. All challenges, no matter how remote they seem, are global challenges. And we must address them as such in collaboration with one another. And this includes an American engagement with China. It has been done before. It can and must for the well-being of humanity be done again. The Honorable Anson Burlingame an American statesman who is little known today can show us the way. On June 14, 1861, President Abraham Lincoln appointed Anson Burlingame as minister to the King Empire. Burlingame served as U.S. ambassador to China from 1861 to 1867 and was invited by the Imperial Chinese court to serve as China's ambassador to all the treaty powers, including the US from 1867 to 1870. Burlingame fostered a policy of cooperation between Western powers and China, intended to secure settlement of disputes by diplomacy rather than by force. His efforts culminated in the Burlingame Treaty of 1868. Burlingame's legacy should be applauded as one of the most relevant reconciliation guides for our own times. His life story projects the promise of America. His underlying principles need to be studied and applied today. Honoring Berlin Games contributions will be a good start to address properly what has become an open wound, both for memory and history. China is a responsible actor and with the United States can collaborate with all nations in building trust empowered by the mutual obligation and a shared commitment to make a better world for the next generation. I am issuing a call for America to co-create with China in the spirit of Anson 
Burlingame, the development of global partnership principles for the 21st century. The goal should not just be to preserve peace in a post-coronavirus world, but to address the global challenges that lie ahead together through global partnership. What better today to launch this initiative than November 16th, the day, the UN Day for Tolerance. I am calling on all wise leaders from both nations who together with invited advisors from other nations may work out together a shareable discourse and agenda for future collaboration, carry forth our endeavors to promote international tolerance, sustainable development, and win-win cooperation at all levels and among all peoples. We seek participants to co-develop principles for a global partnership for the 21st century, reaffirming the goals and objectives of the United Nations. Men of virtue can cooperate, even when they don't agree. Men of meanness cannot cooperate, even when they agree. So did Confucius say. My name is Talal Abu Ghazali, and I'm the founder of Talal Abu Ghazali Global and the founder of, the, of Global Challenges Forum Foundation. Looking forward to hear from you in the short and near future. Warm regards and greetings until then. Thank you. Good evening. I'm Dr. Walter Christman, the co-founder and chairman of the Global Challenges Forum Foundation in Geneva, Switzerland. I'm also the president of the Burlingame Foundation in my home state of California in the United States of America. I'm pleased to greet you today on the occasion of the United Nations designated International Day for Tolerance, November 16th. That also happens to be the 10th anniversary of the Global Challenges Forum. And on this date, November 16, 2020, the founder of the Global Challenges Forum, my good friend, and partner, His Excellency, Dr. Talal Abu Ghazala, is issuing a call for America and the world to co-create with China in the spirit of Anson Burlingame, the development of a global partner of global partnership principles for the 21st century. In his open letter to America and China from an Arab friend, Dr. Abu Ghazala calls for an informal gathering of wise leaders from both nations, who together with invited advisors from other nations may work to fashion a shareable discourse and an agenda for future collaboration. The Global Challenges Forum Foundation would be pleased to convene such a meeting in Geneva, Switzerland this coming year, in collaboration with all interested stakeholding partners. This initiative is in line with the principles of the United Nations Global Compact, which was founded by UN Secretary General Kofi Annan as chairman and was co-chaired by Dr. Abu Ghazala, which he continued to co-chair with the UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon. In support, our foundation has launched a virtual Global Partnership Summit online that will serve for one year as a facilitating partner, inviting the leaders of all nations, international organizations, global corporations, foundations, and indeed global citizens everywhere to join in the process of establishing a new global partnership for the 21st century. We have established the website www.uschinatolerance.com to serve as a platform to host and manage the global engagement process. And we are seeking participants to co-develop principles for global partnership in the 21st century that are reaffirming of the goals and the objectives of the United Nations. 
Moving beyond his previous concerns that the United States and China may be headed for war, Dr. Abu Ghazala is advocating in the aftermath of the U.S. presidential election that the two nations now begin jointly to articulate their shareable interests with the rest of the world. Dr. Abu Ghazala seeks to assure the good future that all nations deserve and may realize through a process of global collaboration can be achieved. For that, we must turn our attention to promoting resilience, developing tolerance, resolving supply chain difficulties, increasing equity around the world, and above all, encouraging our youth to build a sustainable future. In helping to break the chains of the contemporary crisis and help both nations see their way to a better tomorrow, in essence, Dr. Abu Ghazala, in acting in as a representative or voice of the Arab world, is serving as an ambassador of tolerance for both America and China. And in that role, he is serving as a global citizen in the spirit of Anson Burlingame. Anson Burlingame is a little known statesman of the 19th century, but whose principles and methods are worthy of study today as a guide for reconciliation. Burlingame's service, legacy, and merit are compelling and deserving of recognition as a beacon of liberty and leadership needed in every generation, including our own. Burlingame's advocacy of tolerance and equality created a positive legacy for America to draw upon today, for all races, including white America. Burlingame was a fierce abolitionist in the fight against slavery. As a congressman, and he was a founder of the Republican Party. He was appointed by President Lincoln to serve as the United States Ambassador to China, and later was appointed by the Qing Dynasty to serve as their ambassador to the United States and Western powers. Burlingame became the first and only person in the world to ever become an envoy from one nation to then return as an envoy to the sending nation. He was responsible for negotiating for China with the United States what became known as the Burlingame Treaty, the first equality of nations treaty between any Western power in that country. After se securing U.S. approval, he led Chinese de diplomatic delegations as the head of their delegation to England, France, Prussia, and Russia seeking the same. Anson Burlingame died at the age of 49 from pneumonia at the Tsar's court in St. Petersburg, Russia. At his passing, the famous American author, Mark Twain, wrote of him, it is not easy to comprehend at an instant's warning the exceeding magnitude of the loss which mankind sustains in this death. The loss which all nations and all peoples sustain in it, for he had outgrown the narrow citizenship of a state and become a citizen of the world. And his charity was large enough and his heart warm enough to feel for all its races and to labor for them. He was a good man and a very, very great man. America lost a son and all the world a servant when he died. I submit to you that Anson Burlingame was both America's and China's first globalist. And as the famous author Mark Twain said, a citizen of the world. To be a citizen of the world does not require renouncing one's country. After all, important elections are meaningless without, in vote, without voters, and national citizenship is the most important prerequisite. Yet just as national citizenship bestows privileges and responsibilities, so does global citizenship. For it recognizes that one's country is part of a global community of nations, and that national security need not preclude international security. An education in global citizenship includes learning about one's own country and about other countries. It is learning about nations of fellow human beings, peoples whose histories and circumstances have produced different cultures, different ways of life, different ideas, but as human beings that are worthy of respect and efforts to understand them. In short, being a global citizen means you foster tolerance, you promote resilience, and your focus is to create a sustainable world for the next generation. So I am proud to say that in carrying forth his message of a global partnership declaration, our founder, His Excellency Dr. Talal Abu Ghazala, 
has distinguished himself as the Anson Burlingame of the 21st century. In our contemporary era, it serves us well to remember that America once deeply fought racism and promoted tolerance, embraced dignity and promoted human rights for all, and established the principle of equality and mutual respect among nations. This standard has been the glory of the United States of America. And starting today, November 16th, 2020, let it rain once more. Let it silence the drums of war. Thank you very much. Hello, I'm Dr. Walter Christman, the chairman of the Global Challenges Forum Foundation. It's my privilege to have today with us the vice chairman, uh, Dr. Kenneth Nanigan, who has been with the foundation from its inception and is the chairman of the ACTS Group of Institutions in Bangalore, India. So Ken, please uh, share with us your thoughts on Dr. Abhagazala's open letter uh, and the Global Partnership Declaration. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Walter Christman, good friend of mine, Walter, as I know you, it's been a great privilege for me to be associated with the GCF right from its inception. My memories of GCF go back to very vividly meeting up with all of you, getting to know you in Geneva, meeting up with uh, Talal Abu Ghazali, and uh, the way GCF started, the way the movement got going right from the beginning to be involved was a privilege and an honor for me. And on this 10th anniversary that we're celebrating, it gives me great joy to know that Talal, Walter, you both co-founders are still going strong and keeping the movement going, the wheels, the machinery running. That's the important thing. And as uh, we celebrate this uh, 10th anniversary, one thing, we are in a very, very uh, momentous, eventful uh, period with the COVID reality. And that is something that is primarily on our mind. And I'd like to address that, the open letter that Dr. Talal has written is something, the spirit of which I fully identify with. It's so, something that is so uh, needed at the moment, the collaboration between leading players in the world and particularly China. And uh, Walter, your uh, association with China, the Birmingham, you know, the declaration, the uh, foundation there, all of these things gives me real joy to be associated with you and to keep going. One of the things that I am very, very taken up with, with GCF's uh, movement and the ideologies that you, you have associated with, is the concept of resilience. And right now with the COVID reality, resilience is something that is primarily on my mind. We need to be bouncing back. It's not just the health of the world, it's the so many interrelated issues as the UN's SDGs spell out. And for me, the the way education has been really battered has been something of a great concern. On the one side, I see tremendous increases in the way education has continued to be delivered. And uh, the mere rote learning that we were concerned with in India has moved away and people are discovering and uh, experimenting with newer ways. But on the other side, the business of education, at least the economy, the, the fund finances, they've, been, they've taken a real battering and that's been a big concern for me. 
And uh, as we build on this movement of resilience, I have taken the initiative to associate with GCF and the uh, expected Global Resilience University. And starting off with an Institute of Integrated Learning right here in India, and we are uh, probably early next year, we'll be rolling out a postgraduate diploma for teachers in uh, education, in learning. So this is really exciting. And uh, we're planning for hundreds of teachers to be involved, to be able to equip them with things that would concern the present situation and mainly integration so that you know, like the UN SDGs spell out so many interrelated issues, all of these are, we're going to be taking up and uh, resilience, bouncing back. We need to get back whatever the normal is, the new normal, the better normal, whatever it is, we are gearing for that. And I am training up hundreds of people in India to be able to uh, take on that challenge. And GCF is going to be an important part in this. And uh, Dr. Walter, I want to really congratulate you on this 10th anniversary and to say we in India are going to be standing with you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ken. Um, I appreciate the, the efforts that you have made in building this as a con continuing effort that will be relevant for the next 10 years. And Dr. Abu Ghazala in his open letter emphasizes within that the youth empowerment for the future is the central element. Uh, noting in his letter, open letter, that 40% of the world's population is under the age of 40 today. What is worth noting is that in 20, 10 years, by 2030, 50% of the world's population will be under 30. And Dr. Abu Ghazala rightly calls attention to the need for the next generation to be able to address global challenges in a resilient way and with tolerance. Uh, that's why our 10th anniversary celebration occurs actually by happenstance on the UN International Day of Tolerance. We didn't know that when we set it up, but as we set it in motion, it was highly appropriate that our inaugural speech was given by Chinese Ambassador He Yafei, and his speech was on global partnership. And so what we've had, and you were there, present at that speech. And, and what, it, what it really is, is that Dr. Abu Ghazala is bringing us back to our roots, to our founding of a global partnership inauguration in which we have held for the past 10 years forums and identifying with emergent challenges. And this COVID-19 is just the first of many to come. Actually, in 2008, you had the global economic crisis. These things will continue to occur because we live in an integrated world, an integration of uh, systems that have risks to each other and the cascading effects. That is actually not going to change. So what needs to change is integrated learning, no longer stovepiped education, but holistic integrated learning in support of global resilience and tolerance, empowering the youth of the next generation. And that is well embedded in, in the, the expression of Dr. Abu Ghazala's open letter to the United States and China from an Arab friend, precisely because there is at this point no need for further division. It is not healthy to the world that the two most important relations, bilateral relationships in the world can't talk to each other. And so without imposing an agenda, but rather using the Global Challenges Forums, convening authority in Geneva, Switzerland, we've invited leaders from around the world to share their thoughts to shape a new agenda. And your thoughts as you've presented them here on the need for integrated learning to address the integrated global challenges that we face and to build a new approach to, to thinking and leadership that we can pass on and help cultivate with the youth of today is most appropriate. So I thank you very much for your commentary and your support. And Dr. Abu Ghazala thanks you as well, our founder, 
So thank you and very much have a good day. Appreciate it. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'm Dr. Walter Christman, the chairman of the Global Challenges Forum Foundation headquartered in Geneva, Switzerland. Um, we are celebrating the 10th anniversary of our founding uh, on the occasion of the United Nations International Day for Tolerance. Um, we have launched a virtual global partnership summit on this day that will continue forward for a year uh, to bring together um, multi-stakeholder partners around the world uh, to join in developing a new spirit of global partnership. It is in response to His Excellency Dr. Talal Abu Ghazala, who is the founder of, our, of, our, of the Global Challenges Forum uh, in his open letter to America and China in the aftermath of the American election to join together in a new spirit of global partnership and define with each other and with the world what they hold in common with the rest of humanity. I am joined today by um, Mr. Sarbilan Khan. Uh, he is the um, uh, former executive director of the United Nations uh, in ICT Task Force, that's Information Technology and Communica Communications and Technology Task Force and director of ECOSOC. Uh, Dr. Mr. Khan, um, welcome your comments and, and uh, elaborating on Dr. Abu Ghazala's open letter and the Global Partnership Declaration. Over to you, please. Thank you, Walter. It is an honor for me to join you all in commemorating this International Day of Tolerance. This Global Partnership Summit offers a powerful platform to promote tolerance in its broadest sense and on a global scale. Let me say here that my service at the United Nations over the last four decades has been devoted to advancing the UN goals on sustainable development, poverty eradication, and universal access to digital technologies. I therefore welcome and support wholeheartedly the call made by His Excellency Dr. Talal Abu Ghazali in his open letter to the United States and China to build a new partnership on the basis of the Burlingham principles of tolerance and cooperation in meetings to meet today's global challenges. I am thrilled to join hands with leaders and citizens from around the world to work for this noble cause. The declaration of the summit presented to us is well-balanced and short. It says all that needs to be said. I therefore endorse it fully. Thank you, Mr. Khan. Can you tell us a bit about the multi-stakeholder approach that you and Dr. Abu Ghazala did so much to pioneer within the United Nations system? Yes, over the last two decades, the United Nations has created and catalyzed many successful multi-stakeholder partnerships in order, in order to mobilize support in the first stage for the Millennium Development Goals, now for the Sustainable Development Goals. Many of these, including the United Nations ICT Task Force, the Global Compact, the United Nations Global Alliance for ICT and Development and Network 11 for Sustainable Urbanization were led ably by Dr. Talal Abu Ghazali as their chairman or as co-chairman. And I have had the privilege of working with him closely on these initiatives. In particular, the United Nations ICT Task Force chaired by Dr. Abu Ghazali functioned as a flexible multi-stakeholder network of networks with well-defined and specific objectives for each of its networks, which were led by tech and business leaders. And in recognition of its accomplishments and its innovative mechanisms, the task force was given the highest United Nations prize, the UN 21 award in 2005. I think in my view, it is vastly important 
that the partnership building and its universal character of the United Nations and its neutral character, the United Nations offer the most attractive platform for the proposed global challenge partnerships that you have in mind. Thank you very much. Um, it's, it's quite clear there's a strong track record of engagement between the United Nations and civil society partners. Can you suggest how this initiative might best be carried out? Yes, indeed. So given the political and bureaucratic complexities of the world organization, it would be prudent to have only an arm's length affiliation with the United Nations at the highest level, that is with the office of the Secretary General. To this end, some of the, these partnerships that I have mentioned, such as the UNICT Task Force, the UN Gate, and the Global Compact can provide a good possible model to build upon for the Global Challenges Partnership Initiative. Thank you very much for that insight. Um, how would you characterize the relevance today of Dr. Abu Ghazala's open letter uh, to America and China in the aftermath of the recent election? Well, I must say the open letter by Dr. Abu Ghazali has come at a crucial, crucial moment in world affairs. As the United States transitions to a new administration, the character of the US-China relationship and with it, the future of the post-international, post-war international order hang in the balance. The importance of the US-China relationship is such that the whole world waits poised precariously at an inflection point. If the United States and China continue on their current path of growing mistrust and tension, the world seems likely to slide into a new Cold War, which could turn out to be even more destructive than the last one. The United Nations Secretary General, Mr. Antonio Guterres, recently warned that if the US and China continue to go their own ways, the world is in danger of splitting into two rival blocks. He has made a forceful plea to them to cooperate in order to overcome major global challenges such as the current pandemic and climate change. If world leaders in the political, civil, and commercial spheres join hands to mount a global campaign to nudge the two countries away from their destructive rivalry, it may still be possible to persuade them to forge a mutually beneficial partnership within which their complementary and competing interests can be balanced. Together, then they can lead the world into a new era of shared prosperity, equity, and sustainability to the benefit of all humanity. And I think your initiative, this Global Challenges Partnership, can mobilize such global public opinion in support of this objective. Thank, thank you very much for those generous comments. It is indeed important that both nations agree upon the interests that they hold in common with the rest of humanity. COVID-19 has illustrated how the emerging challenges of the 21st century are different. Uh, would you like to comment more about that? Well, let me say the main point is that as time passes, these global challenges tend to become more imminent more complex and more intractable and more universal in scope as well. G let me give an example. Perhaps the most important lesson from the current pandemic is that unforeseen and extreme events in any place can disrupt normal life across the globe and cause enormous damage to the world economy. Also, the lack of a timely and well-coordinated international response can further accentuate the adverse impact of global crisis. Today, there is broad scientific consensus that changing climate will trigger more frequent extreme weather events and disasters. Also, the incidence of epidemics 
has increased in recent years. Given these trends, one of the most pressing and paramount challenges for the international community in the period ahead will be to strengthen and devise practical arrangements and mechanisms for building a much more resilient world economy. We need to build resilience in our communities and cities, in our health systems and safety nets, in our production processes and supply chains, in our trade, transport, and travel sectors, in our crisis prevention, preparedness, and management institutions, and in our research and development capacities at the local, national, and global levels. The current pandemic has also shown that digital and other emerging technologies will need to be placed at the center of this global effort. Digitally enabled resilience planning and modeling, for example, drawing upon cutting edge technologies can serve as important tools for professionals and policymakers to forecast scenarios, identify and fill gaps, enhance coherence and achieve the needed scale in our response to major crisis. I think this is a challenge in which the United Nations and the business community and civil society can really work together to make it happen. Thank you very much. And um, I appreciate that you have taken a leadership role for many decades now in the development of multi-stakeholder partnerships within the United Nations and um, have a good feel for civil society at all levels. How, how would you characterize what, what America can do now? Well, I want to conclude by recalling uh, a moment of history from the past century, not past century, actually 19th century, when uh, the French diplomat and philosopher de Tocqueville, after having traveled around the United States, marveled at the ability of Americans to come together in spontaneous civil society associations to achieve their shared goals. He noticed that there were hundreds of such associations flourishing in America. Now I would say the world needs America to lead the way once again in strengthening cooperation at the global level. In the same spirit, American spirit, in order to meet the challenges of the 20th, 21st century. And I must add, if America leads the way, the world will follow. Thank you. Thank you very much for those very insightful remarks, comprehensive, and at the same time, they speak to the character of global citizenship in the 21st century, not only as individuals, but in, in the corporate level, in the international organizations and in nations, it's, it's um, very much a, a, a statement in the spirit of the Global Partnership Declaration of Dr. Abu Ghazala. We have established this virtual Global Partnership Summit as an online initiative for a year and a website to elaborate and support collaborations uh, between communities and building toward an event, we hope sometime middle of next year in Geneva, uh, to bring together a group of wise leaders to help fashion a statement of of collaboration around what we call Burlingame principles um, and for global resilience, uh, sustainable development, and in light of the tolerance that's needed uh, for youth of this generation to carry forward and, com and combat the, the emergent challenges that they will face for the rest of this century. Thank you for your commentary and uh, your, your long-standing participation in guiding and developing the multi-stakeholder partners, the partnerships of the United Nations. I thank you very much for this opportunity and look, I look forward to working actively and close collaboration with you and Dr. Bogazale to make your initiative a great success. Thank you very much. For that, good evening. Thank you. Thank you, good evening. Good evening, I'm Dr. Walter Christman. I am the uh, chairman of the Global Challenges Forum Foundation in Geneva, Switzerland. Um, we are celebrating our 10th anniversary today 
uh, on November 16th, 2020, which happens to be the United Nations designated International Day for Tolerance. And um, I have with me Joseph Baxer, who is representing the United Nations Association of the USA. He hails from Connecticut and he has a background in um, strategies for peace in non-governmental organizations and, and as well as an educator uh, in uh, uh, the development of, uh, shall we say, a human consciousness of psychology and theology and the wellness of the world. So we're very pleased to have Joseph with you, with us. Um, Joseph, would you uh, share us some of your thinking about uh, our project uh, from Dr. Abu Ghazala bringing together uh, the United States and China into perhaps hopefully in the aftermath of the American election, a, uh, a, a more useful dialogue. Over to you, please. Thank you very much. I'm uh, pleased and honored to participate in this International Day of Tolerance in this virtual global partner summer summit. I can imagine no better way to begin than to quote the United Nations Declaration establishing this day. Tolerance is respect, acceptance, and appreciation of the rich diversity of our world's cultures, our forms of expression and ways of being human. Tolerance, the virtue that makes peace possible, contributes to the replacement of the culture of war by a culture of peace. As I explore the multitude of issues that weigh upon the nearly 8 billion people who inhabit the earth, I particularly wish to focus on the emerging reality that we are becoming a bipolar world, that the geopolitical and economic centers of the world rest with the United States and the People's Republic of China. I do not intend to exclude uh, other nations um, or the other or populations, nor wish to fail to acknowledge the reality of the ethnic and sovereign diversity of Homo sapiens on our planet. In actuality, I choose to focus my attention where I sense the greatest impact for the future may be implemented. Ban Ki Moon, our previous Secretary General of the United Nations, in confronting a moment of crisis, which for him happened often, um, but they were also moments of opportunity, stated that our time is now. I believe our time is now to find a path forward for the future of the human race. And my conviction is that central to that path is tolerance, understanding, collaboration. What I might call the identity of a global citizen. Both the US and China are presently facing extraordinary challenges. First, I speak to my fellow Americans exhausted by an intense election process, many anguished with emotional wounds. At the same time, an overwhelming pandemic from the COVID virus has touched more than 10 million. I weep. The death toll is in the hundreds of thousands and rising. Again, I suffer. Millions are unemployed or underemployed. All Americans I have met in recent weeks, actually all, feel tenseness in their shoulders, carrying a weight of suffering, uncertainty, and fear as events unfold. What kind of a global partner will America be? Either stymied by nationalism or engaged in the world with respectful diplomacy. So my words to my fellow Americans. And secondly, I speak to the citizens of China whose gracious hospitality and welcome I have experienced several times, both on the mainland and in Hong Kong. I congratulate you as a people who have been able to control the virus and return to more normal life. 
I congratulate you as a nation for eliminating and helping more people reach beyond poverty than in the whole history of the world within the last century. I'm aware that there are challenges also that weigh upon you. A nation whose, develop, whose identity has developed over many centuries. Indeed, China is a nation that is and has been rapidly coming to age after a century of humiliation. Its economic prowess has been truly amazing. Yet as it establishes its place within the community of nations, unease about Hong Kong, the detention of the Uyghurs, the contested islands in the South China Sea, the Belt and Road Initiative invite concern among some Chinese citizens um, within your borders and in the neighboring global community. What kind of global partner will China be? either stymied by nationalism or engaged in the world with respectful democracy. So my words to you who are Chinese. The truth is, in this moment, both the US and China each face growing challenges in their role within the world's power structure. In this context, I wish to urge a sense of global citizenship to each American and to every Chinese person as a model for what is needed for our two countries. The three characteristics that I would propose at once, elementary and simultaneously profound. This day's emphasis is tolerance, a willingness to acknowledge differences. Different points of view, philosophies and cultures are evident. I do not think it is naive to say that for individuals and for nations, respectful tolerance is the beginning of a conversation. Moreover, I believe that understanding can follow tolerance. Let me repeat that. I believe that understanding can follow tolerance. This is not me in agreement, but a willingness to try to appreciate another's perspective and insights and truth. Finally, Collaboration can arise in mutual respect. Often it will require patience, compromise, a willingness to envision the common good for individuals and for the community of nations as essential. We live in a multilateral world. We are interconnected and the globalization is here to stay, be it the pandemic, the environmental crisis, cybersecurity, economic well being, the implementation of the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. No one on the planet Earth can remain isolated. Yet, in truth, we are also living in this bipolar world. And for the moment, the energy, vision, and integrity of China and the US will dominate. I can only hope and trust for the best. My conclusion is direct, an invitation on this International Day of Tolerance to each person listening and to each of our nations to commit to global citizenship. It is an invitation to creativity and to creatively find that our time is now. It is in our enlightened self-interest it is the way to peace. Thanks very much for taking time to listen. Thank you very much, Dr. Baxter. I am taken with the Our Time is Now theme from Ban Ki-moon, uh, the UN Secretary General. What is noteworthy is that 40% of the world's population today is under the age of 25. That in 10 years, at the end of the sustainable develop 17 sustainable goal development goals by 2030 a majority of the population of the world will be under the age of 25 and i'm told that there are more people alive today than have ever died so from the standpoint of a global human consciousness and global human citizenship 
the entire world, in a sense, the majority is of, of all human history is soon to be upon us, which is to say a great audience for what we do today. And at this particular moment, we are witnessing the effects of the interconnectedness of globalization and our planet and how crises in one area can spill over into others. The, this, I would suggest to you that, that we face a, a new type of challenge with the Global Challenges Forum Foundation, that in 2008, in the world economic crisis, uh, the um, global economic uh, contagion required global coordination and did in the banking community, and you might suggest that was the first world war of the 21st century. And now with the pandemic, we are facing the second world war of the 21st century, a globally interconnected battlefield where nations collaborate or not uh, trying to cope with emergent challenges. This is probably the new normal, not the pandemic, but the fact that the planet is at risk of an interconnectedness. And at the same time, moving from a challenge, as you suggested, an opportunity to a solution that solution would appear to be a shared global citizenship and mutual respect and tolerance to the fact that we're really all in this together. And divisiveness and division among nations is not helpful. And in that respect, the ongoing discussions between the United States and China of late have been unhelpful. We are looking at the aftermath of an American election and as you suggested, hopeful. Uh, but that doesn't necessarily translate immediately into a new normal of dialogue between the nations. The Chinese promote the idea of win-win. Right now, the Americans have taken a much more direct approach, a unilateral approach to interests, which is to say zero sum, which might be win-lose. We are in danger of moving to lose-lose, that the absence of a shareable consensus of what we all hold in common puts us all at risk. So Dr. Abu Ghazala's open letter to America and China basically moves past the challenges and opportunities to suggest the solution, that the two nations come together to help define what they hold in their interests in common with the rest of humanity. And your speech has drawn that out so brilliantly, so, so eloquently, and, and, and laying out what not only the United States and China hold in common, but what all nations do and all global citizens do. So I thank you very much. At the same time, what I will say is that we have issued a declaration, of a, a, a global de partnership declaration uh, to convene under our auspices in collaboration with the United Nations in Geneva, a, uh, a gathering of, of, of wise, wise leaders and friends to work out what we call Burlingame principles for the 21st century. And since you're the only one of our interviewees who hails from New England, uh, I should like to bring forth the fact that Anson Burlingame was a congressman from uh, New England and an abolitionist, a man fiercely devoted to the equality of man. And at the same time as an abolitionist, uh, was a founder of the Republican Party rather interesting today from the standpoint of where that party stands in relationship to its own heritage, we can debate that. However, that as a uh, founder of the Republican Party, he campaigned more for his own, uh, for Abraham Lincoln's election than his own and lost his election. As a consequence, having become sent as United States ambassador to China, earned the reputation of the imperial court as a fair and honorable man, a genuine Yankee, who denounced the European powers for the way they treated the Chinese, and they invited him to become their ambassador to the United States and Western powers. And as such, he, he ventured forth under their authority, wearing, carrying their flag, to America and ultimately back to New England as well as Washington and elsewhere to promote the notion that there is not only an equality of man but an equality of nations. And as a champion of equality of nations was responsible for having the United States Senate approve the Burlingame Treaty, the first equality of nations treaty, 
and led the, the uh, Chinese delegations to Europe seeking the same equality for them among all the royal courts of Europe, passing away in St. Petersburg, Russia, of pneumonia. And that, that sense of, of spirit of America, which you intolerance and promoting international collaboration and global citizenship, I would submit to you that Anson Burlingame was the first American globalist and Chinese globalist of the 19th century. And what we are doing today is to revisit that spirit, which frankly, as a Connecticut Yankee, you have represented admirably well. I, I salute you. Thank you very much for your comments and, and your contribution. Thank you for your kind words. Privileged to be able to share this with you. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm Dr. Walter Christman, chairman and co-founder of the Global Challenges Forum Foundation in Geneva, Switzerland. Uh, we have with us today, uh, Ralph Thiele, who is the chairman of the German Political Military Society in Berlin uh, and president of Eurodefense. Uh, we are speaking on the occasion of the 10th anniversary of the Global Challenges Forum Foundation in response to Dr. Talal Abu Ghazala's open letter uh, to America and China and the uh, call for a global partnership in a global partnership declaration. Uh, and uh, Ralph Thiele is a top strategic planner. So give us your thoughts, Ralph, if you would, please. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, Walter. So I give you a top plan <laughs> how to deal with the issues. Uh, many thanks, first of all, for the kind invitation to speak at such an important uh, occasion. Uh, and I give you the German perspective uh, where I full heartedly endorse Dr. Talal Abu Ghazaleh's open letter to America and China from an Arab friend. Indeed, uh, prom promoting resilience, uh, developing tolerance, increasing equity around the world, and encouraging our use, this is at the very core of building a sustainable future. Germany's assessment of the situation vis-a-vis -vis China takes into account uh, the strategic interests of the European Union, China's history, Beijing's interests and ambitions, and China as a major economic and military power. From this perspective, China is not seen as an enemy, but rather as a rising world power a negotiating partner, a competitor, and a strategic rival. Problems should be clearly addressed and solutions sought on both sides. The Belt and Road Initiative is a vivid example of how China is realizing its strategic objectives via incremental steps. The Corona virus pandemic has cast a disquieting light on the consequences of the resulting economic dependence on China for many Western uh, nations, including Germany. Next year, in fact, China wants to become the leading regional power and by 2049, the global leader. And when you look at the Chinese uh, performance getting there, this includes uh, several problematic activities. These include influencing political and economic elites and lobby groups using the Silk Road Initiative uh, uh, to uh, as a most important means of geopolitical reorganization and uh, creating financial and economic dependencies. The German business uh, community indeed, which has so far largely oriented itself to the well-running business relation with China is becoming increasingly concerned about Beijing's economic practices. Consequently, China is being observed more critical worldwide Alliances between the United States and Australia, Japan, India, and Great Britain are being deepened. And likewise, the European Union is seeking similar-minded global cooperation partners. I recall a visit uh, to Beijing uh, several years ago, where I was invited for a conference participation in political talks. And at this occasion, General Xiong Zhuangkai, the former Deputy Inspector General of the People's Liberation Army, stress the need for mutual trust, cooperation, and equality in the international security dialogue. He explained the development of Chinese security policy and emphasized that since 1980 already, the Chinese leadership has held the view that long-term peace is possible. Against this background, he explained the Chinese concept of comprehensive integrated security 
that explicitly includes economic, energy, information, supply, environmental, etc., aspects and aims at a common multilateral approach. He repeatedly called for the abandonment of zero-sum approaches to security policy, i.e. the gain for one correspondence to the loss of the other. And he suggested to instead to work in a win-win constellation uh, to together for world peace and seek peaceful ways solutions in the sense of a win-win strategy. I must confess at that time I was confused because uh, my understanding was this is uh, exactly the direction the world is taking, but instead of win-win in the past decade, the world has moved towards the zero-sum direction. Your loss is my gain, and accordingly the threat of violent approaches has increased, so I must uh, applaud the Chinese obviously had a better view at least than I had at this time. The new US presidency may become an important turning point. It is associated with the hopes of countless people across the world, including, of course, the Germans. And as uh, our uh, the German federal president, Frank-Walter Steinmeier, has uh, pointed out a couple of days ago, it is a hope for a new common ground. This is an apt moment, he said, to renew the transatlantic partnership. And we clearly should together develop our relationship with China. This is the time to move beyond the contemporary crisis and take the past towards a better tomorrow. The US-China relationship is critical to the future of the global international order. Putting it on a prosperous path is, a key, is of key importance, but not necessarily an easy exercise. The elected new US President Joe Biden aims at making America respected around the world again. He said uh, last week, emphasizing, and I quote him, we will lead not only by the example of our power, but by the power of our example. And exactly here, I would connect to the truly wise Burlingame remarks as quoted in Dr. Talal's letter, the imagination kindles at the future, which may be and which will be, if you will be fair and just to China. We definitely are challenged to dare such an approach. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ralph. I appreciate especially the insightful analysis around the, the contemporary moment, which Dr. Abu Ghazala had called forth. He has been known for a rising concern of the potential war between the United States and China, and his open letter coming in the aftermath of the American election urges both sides to identify their interests that, in which they, that they share with the rest of humanity. And the, in, that, in this respect, um, building global resilience, and especially in the aftermath of COVID, promoting tolerance, which is in this occasion, the Interna United Nations International Day of Tolerance, and in particular, his focus on the future to encourage youth to become participants in shaping their own destiny are all elements of, of a collaborative approach. Um, that can join nations from around the world and people of all ages as world citizens. Uh, your analysis is particularly incisive because the relationship, the Euro-Atlantic and transatlantic relationship to deal uh, with a rising China in a cooperative vein uh, and approach can, can only strengthen all parties and, and return us to win-win formulas as opposed to zero sum, win, lose, and ultimately where I think we are today, lose, lose. So thank you for, for, for identifying the strategic importance of the moment. Dr. Abu Ghazala's um, call for a global partnership uh, declaration approach based on Burlingame principles. Uh, we look forward, to, Ralph, to you joining that conversation and helping us to shape the understanding of a shareable discourse in, in Burlingame principles for the 21st century. Thank you very much. And yeah, thank you, Walter. Good morning. I'm Dr. Walter Christman, chairman of the Global Challenges Forum Foundation, and we are uh, celebrating the 10th anniversary of the foundation founded by Dr. Talal Abu Ghazala. I have with us today Dr. Beatrice Bresson, who is the executive director. Uh, in Geneva, Switzerland. And Dr. Bresson is a uh, scientist, nuclear physicist actually, an author and poet, a humanitarian and a world citizen. And so welcome Dr. Dr. 
Bresson. I uh, would like to turn the floor over to you and, and hear your thoughts on uh, the Global Partnership Declaration and our anniversary celebration with Dr. Abu Ghazala's uh, open letters. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Walter um, Christman, for introducing me and giving me the possibility to, to talk today. Uh, as you said, it's an important year because it's uh, the recurrence of the 10th university, the 10th, sorry, anniversary of uh, the Global Challenges Forum Foundation. And linked to that, there are many initiatives, including this, the Global Partnership. Um, what I, um, I, and also I, I really thank uh, Dr. Um, Talala Bugazal. Uh, it's a, an honor uh, to, to, to share with, you know, uh, some thought about his approach and um, regarding the, the, the global challenges in general. Um, so I, um, I really believe uh, as our foundation and uh, also the, the global partnership in the three pillars, which are resilience and um, uh, advocacy of tolerance. Uh, so first of all, a culture to build a culture of resilience, uh, advocacy of tolerance, and, and also um, uh, in general, a sustainable development. Uh, but all this, I think, is based really in youth empowerment, so giving the possibility to young people to uh, become uh, future leaders. Um, and uh, one of our uh, pillars project is this 1 million 2030, uh, which uh, foreseen uh, to accompany in their uh, uh, in their grow, growing, uh, growing um, experience uh, professionally and personally to become future leaders um, uh, by 2030 and beyond. Um, basically, uh, what I, I always been believing is that uh, uh, what is really important to create a new future uh, based on globalization and global partnership is having a real impact on society. Uh, this is why um, our foundation, it's, um, it's, it's based on empowering youth uh, and starting for their initiative. Uh, because I think what is, what is important is to create like a tri triangulation of different um, of, um, let's say of different environment. Uh, one is this, one of this is the education and then it's also um, a little initiative like uh, startups and also big initiative like uh, multinational organization like uh, for example, UN uh, related organization and agency and by you know, um, empowering this connection uh, and through the activities of youth, uh, we can really have a, a strong impact on and benefit society and really um, face and find solution for, uh, for what we are the global challenges in general and being in line with the 17 sustainable goals of the UN 2030 agenda. Excellent, thank you, Dr. Bresson. Um, I'm, I would take note, especially your comment on the 17 Sustainable Development Goals. The 17th Sustainable Development Goal actually is partnership. So basically we rolled all of these together. I especially appreciate you drawing attention. Uh, Dr. Abu Ghazala's open letter focuses on uh, joining the United States and China in a new dialogue around the interests that they share in common with the rest of humanity. 40% of the world's population today is under 25. And in, in 10 years, in 2030, half the world will be under 
25. So they clearly hold those two in common. China has a larger share, perhaps, of, of, of that population. The rest of the world is, is concerned with the sustainable development and continuity, and I appreciate you drawing especially attention to that. It was quite well noted that uh, Dr. Abu Ghazala was the beneficiary of a United Nations uh, Relief Works Agency UNRWA scholarship as a young man um, and was able to attend the American University of Beirut, which goes to show that education empowers youth. And so we're, we're proud of him as our founder. Uh, at the same time, uh, you mentioned 1 million 2030. I'd like to spell that out, which is the initiative of the Global Challenges Forum Foundation launched that in Delhi, India on the occasion of the 150th anniversary of the birth of Mahatma Gandhi. And 1M2030 stands for 1 million youth leaders for sustainable development beyond 2030, meaning carrying the torch beyond the sustainable development goals for the rest of the 20th, 21st century. And so the youth empowerment theme is, is on the one hand an investment toward the future, but because the, the population of youth are present, they actually are the present too. So we're very proud of, of how you have uh, encouraged youth to come together, taking special note of, of, of uh, your, your strong support for Palestinian youth in particular and your devotion to that. So it's a personal, personal uh, uh, you know, accomplishment uh, uh, that, that you have, have helped others to achieve and, and drawing upon your strengths uh, we're very pleased to have you as our executive director. So thank you very much for your comments. Thank and you. Um, may I add something? Uh, yes, of course. Um, uh, there are two things that uh, I, I wish uh, we can accomplish in the future on, on the line of the effort of uh, Dr. Talala Bugazal, and this, of course, opening that dialogue between uh, uh, powerful nations, and he's starting with America and China, but I really wish that in the future we can uh, enlarge this di dialogue also to other um, countries, which uh, have like important role in the global uh, uh, approach to the world. And also uh, something that you mentioned that is important uh, regarding the Palestinian for our project 1 million 2030, but I wanted to underline that we are not only focusing on this uh, area, we have uh, practically three pillars, uh, a geographical area, and including India and Africa, etc. And one of the approach, it's really to select or to choose people from disadvantaged country, uh, because the fact that they, ha they had to um, face many difficulties also give them the, the capacity to, uh, to forge their own uh, personality and to create uh, special initiative around uh, uh, specific needs. And this will uh, increase uh, the development, the sustainable development, especially in the, area, in the, area, in the areas where, where there are more uh, difficulties. Thank, thank you very much. And I'd like to also commend that uh, for our board, you have prepared uh, a 10 year strategic plan to help us achieve those things. And we thank you for your leadership and your comments today. Thank you very much. Welcome, thank you for inviting me. Good evening, I am Dr. Walter Christman, uh, the chairman of the Global Challenges Forum Foundation. And we are on the occasion of our 10th anniversary, uh, November 16, 2010. Uh, was the official launch with a speech on global partnership by Chinese ambassador Ke Yafei. Ten years later, we've come back to um, reinvest ourselves in the concept of global partnership. Uh, Dr. His Excellency Dr. Talal Abu Ghazala, our founder, um, has uh, promulgated an open letter to China and America in the aftermath of the recent American elections. Uh, calling for both nations to come together and to define what interests they hold in common that they share with the rest of the world. Uh, this happens to be the United Nations designated International Day for Tolerance. We are joined today by Dr. George Koo, who is the chairman of the Burlingame Foundation, a frequent author in Asia Times, 
his most recent trip to China with American Friends delegation was pursuing peaceful ends by peaceful means. And in that respect, we are eager to hear what he has to say in response to both uh, Dr. Abu Ghazala's open call in the letter, the Global Partnership Declaration, and his thoughts on the contemporary relevance of ants in Berlingay. Uh, Dr. Ku, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Walter. It's been, what, five years since we talked about what a remarkable person Anson Berlingay was. He was a man of honor, integrity, and most important of all, his respect for the dignity of a human life. It didn't, doesn't matter whether the, the ethnicity or the, or the background, the station, the fact that he was anti-slavery tells you all about, about how he feels about help, fellow person. And when he went to Beijing in the diplomatic corps, he was the only ambassador that stood for and supported the sovereignty of, of China. All the other Western nations were there to look for opportunities to carve up China. So his stance impressed the heck out of the um, Manchu court and the regent Prince Gong. Then surprisingly, when Berlingay was ready to come back, asked him to become the ambassador, the head of the team, to visit Western countries and renegotiate the unequal treaties uh, that existed at the time. He promptly resigned from Washington and took the delegation. He made a first stop in the United States and he negotiated with Secretary of State uh, Seward, resulting this, in this treaty called the Treaty of 1868, which we subsequently call the Burning Game Treaty of 1868. That treaty turns out to be a very important relationship building between the US and China, even though the goodwill generated by that treaty, which basically says that the this equal sovereignty between United States and, uh, uh, and China um, had been tested many times since then. But one of the lasting contribution was it enabled 120 boys, young boys from China to come live in Connecticut, Massachusetts with missionary families and was raised to understand what American democracy and American government was like. They then went on to such schools as Yale, Harvard, MIT, Columbia, and others. And by the time they went back to China, they became leaders and technologists for China during the Republican Revolution, after the Republican Revolution of 1911. So there is this residual goodwill that the Chinese people feels towards America because America was different. They didn't treat China like the other Western countries. So I think, Walter, that you named Dr. Abu Ghazala the Anson Burning Game of the 21st century. I have not met, I have not had the pleasure to meet him, but I have to say, that is truly high praise uh, to put him in the same uh, position. And then I have to say, I really agree with his idea that the, it takes a global partnership in the 21st century to uh, generate the kind of peace and prosperity that we're, we need. So on that topic, in that area, uh, I, I think it's my job to comment about the US-China relations because they're the two big elephants in the room. Um, if they cannot settle things peacefully, we're not gonna have a global partnership. And I um, uh, applaud Dr. Abu Ghazala for his letters to China and his letters to, um, and his letters to uh, um, the United States his intentions and goodwill are evident in those letters. 
the question is, will they listen? And the problem primarily has been an ideological one and the ideology is coming from the US side. China would love, love to get, get along, but uh, it seems like if you look at the what the Trump administration did for the last four years, they try to beat China down every which way possible. Their so-called trade war, the terrorist levered was supposed to even up the trade balance of course, the trade balance got worse. And the IP infringement they accused China of, they use that as an excuse to suppress Huawei every way possible. Well, that just means that many of the Western countries that have already installed Huawei equipment is going to lose years and billions of investment if they have to tear that down and put somebody else's system in. And finally, Republicans accuse China of being a national security threat. And ironically, what that means is that the more naval flotilla from the US that goes to South China Sea in the name of freedom of navigation, the more the American government feels threatened by China. Not because the Chinese have naval ships in the Caribbean or off the coast of California, but because our ships are in South China Sea, we feel threatened. This is nonsense. Now, unfortunately, the anti-China feelings is bipartisan. The Democrats, by and large, accuse China of human rights violations. Well, here's a country that has pulled 850 million people out of poverty. Even some of the most remote areas, it's taken them a while, but they get to them, they build roads, they build housing for them, they teach farmers how to increase their yield, how to switch to more profitable crops, or to develop their native handicraft for uh, sale. And with the, with the internet proliferation in China, with live streaming, it's possible to sell from anywhere to anywhere in the country. Consequently, the poor poverty stricken people have more livelihood, more means of making a living. And because they're in the remote area and because of the infrastructure built in China, you now have tourism as an additional boom to some of these very remote regions of China. This doesn't speak like a human right abusing type country. Furthermore, the Ash Center at Kennedy School, um, the, at Harvard's Kennedy School has been conducting on the ground survey of people's sentiment on their Chinese government. And that's been going on for more than a decade. The approval reading started in the low 80%. It's now at 93% approval. That's an unheard of percentage. We could, we in the US would do as well at half of that approval rating. So it's, it's really time to rethink the relationship and why is it in our interest to be an adversary to China. Now, interesting, after, the, uh, after Joe Biden became the president elect, um, one of the video that went viral in, uh, uh, in China was at a, at a time when he was vice president, he visited Beijing and Ambassador Gary Locke and he and, and I think three others went to a local noodle restaurant and had lunch. Now, usually when you have VIPs visiting a restaurant, the owner would offer them a private room, but Biden didn't want any of that. He wants to sit down with the people and have lunch sitting right in, in the same tables as the, uh, in the general restaurant room. And all, of course, the, the Chinese people were delighted. They all sidled up to him for photo ops. And the owner of the restaurant still remembers to this day what he ordered, what they ate, and the fact that the bill came out to 79 B, and he gave them, he gave her the 
a hundred Ramimbi and insisted that she keep the change. And that story is going around. It shows that he can be a charming, people, warm people person. And that's what he needs to bring to the relationship between US and China. Now, a close collaboration is going to be of beneficial to uh, uh, no question to the United States because one of his men's mandate is to deal with the coronavirus, COVID-19. Well, you can't deal with that in isolation, unlike what President Trump has done. You have to deal with it and treat it as a global problem, a global pandemic, and furthermore, both China and the US are leading in the development of vaccines. You need to figure out how to allocate vaccines and stamp out the virus worldwide basis, otherwise it just comes back. You also, US and China also need to deal with the climate change. And again, that's a problem that the two leading countries, two leading economies, of the, uh, of the world must cooperate and work together and provide leadership. And this is actually a pretty easy one to do because both President Xi Jinping and President Biden, elect, President-elect Biden, both feel strongly about having to deal with the climate change. So that's a good start to, deliberate, to develop a collaborative uh, relationship. Jobs. Joe Biden promised to bring jobs to the United to, to the states, something that Donald Trump did nothing of. He didn't bring any jobs back. To bring jobs back, you need to have investments in manufacturing. You need to have com companies with leading technology, leading managerial ability to do that. And in point of fact, some of the Chinese companies have been in the US for years. For example, Hire makes appliances and Hire has started out in South Carolina. They end up taking over the appliance part that used to belong to GE in Louisville, Kentucky, Miss McConnell's home state, by the way. That acquisition saved probably tens of thousands of jobs because GE used to be a leading appliance maker in the world and certainly a leading maker in the United States. You have um, China Construction in America. They're based in New Jersey now. They receive a commission to rebuild the Alexander Hamilton Bridge, which is the extension of G GW Bridge, George Washington Bridge, in north of the uh, uh, Manhattan Island. It was a $407 million contract, the largest the state of New York has ever given to, uh, to a company. And CCA, China Construction America, brought the project in within budget and ahead of time, ahead of schedule. And they convert a four lane dilapidated old bridge into an eight lane, a bridge that has won all kinds of uh, awards for their civil construction and design. There's a China rolling stock, CRRC. They created two assembly plants in Chicago and in Boston, outside of Boston, to, re to build new subway coaches to replace, again, old dilapidated coaches. And that's a really a win-win deal because there's um, uh, uh, six, over 60% local content that requires manufacturing in the United States. And each of the assembly plant meant 150 jobs for local workers. And what China supplied was the design of the latest and the most advanced de design for co the subway coaches. They provide the outer shell, they bring that in from China and their competitive bid was 20% lower than anybody else. And anybody else meant foreign suppliers anyway, because the American manufacturers don't make subway coaches anymore. So those are kind of examples of what China investments can do in America that will create jobs. What 
the U.S. has to get over is envy and accept the fact that there are things that are more advanced in the, um, that the Chinese has to offer. Thirdly, and most importantly, China's middle class is now about 400 million people and growing, and they are voracious in what they buy. The import market um, every year now in China is $2 trillion or more, a total import market. The U.S. needs to get part of that. They need to sell to China. They need to build bases there. And the proof of the pudding is that the American companies are already there. General Motors, Coca-Cola, SD Lauder, they made money during this coronavirus crisis. A lot more money in China to cover their losses elsewhere in the world. That tells you that we need to figure out, Biden administration need to figure out how to get on this win-win quadrant instead of the lose-lose quadrant, which I wrote about recently in, uh, in Asia Times. In fact, the title says it all. Biden must avoid lose-lose confrontation with China. So this is my thoughts, Walter, on, on the global uh, forum and, and the global partnership. It has to start with US and China working together. Thank you, Dr. Ku. The um, concept of the Global Partnership Declaration uh, for the foundation is to collaborate with stakeholding organizations and, of course, the Burlingame Foundation, which your chairman would be quite pleased to have that uh, participation. At the same time, we are looking to tie in to the United Nations. Um, the business that you mentioned there is quite interesting. You focused on the practical aspects of the uh, bilateral relationship in economic terms in a global, a global world. Is Dr. Abu Ghazala was the co-chair with Ban Kofi Annan and then later Ban Ki-moon of the Global Compact, <clears throat> which is the United Nations Secretary General's relationship with uh, the private sector. And it has a membership of 13,000 corporations. And, it, and as you suggest that these partnerships need not be limited to the exchange of notes at a diplomatic level in which a, a, a certain amount of hate and hostility can be construed in the kinds of things that you use for political points for domestic purposes to be able to uh, showcase uh, tensions in the relationship. Some of them are real. Uh, the, the intellectual property issues are genuine and, and that China has uh, taken steps to amend them, but nonetheless, you can't amend what you aren't doing wrong. But at the same time, it's opening up. And in that respect, I do believe that a global partnership at all levels, which includes not only the, the governments of nations and collaborations of international organizations, but as you rightly point out, can include global corporations and businesses, and at the same time, local companies, all the way down to Grassroots America, being able to sell products abroad in a, in a competitive environment. Most importantly, in, in this respect, in, the, in the, um, Dr. Abu Ghazala's call for a dialogue, recognizing that there are some issues that are thorny and difficult, such as the perspectives on the South China Sea and other things like that, those might be held in abeyance for easier things to work on to get started. And Dr. Abu Ghazala suggested three areas of collaboration and building out a vision of Burlingame principles for the 21st century. One, of course, is tolerance and focusing on the collaboration of, of building a culture of tolerance. Uh, in that respect, the uh, UN Day of International Tolerance was not only, um, you know, our 10th anniversary, it was the date that I'm sorry, the inaugural speech by Hoy Ambassador Hoyafe on global partnership was a happy coincidence of history. We didn't know it at the time. We just found out when we went to look for our 10th anniversary, it happened to be on that day. And there's a certain symbolism in that, pregnant and waiting for, for a better future. Where we stand today in this is moving forward, which is to say, looking at the foundation the next 10 years, we're mindful of something, and that is the United Nations 17 Sustainable Development Goals to 2030, 
uh, of the 17 sustainable development goals that the UN is and nations of, of the world have mapped out together, the 17th sustainable development goal is partnership. So one of the things that, that you can have is, is more than just the happy phrases of partnership, but actionable items of lanes of effort in which the various 17 sustainable development goals can be areas of cooperation between the United States and China as they work out what they hold in common with the rest of the world and produce win-win solutions in, in, a, in a different fashion. Win, 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 three wins. The United States, China, and the rest of the world bringing that together into a very holistic approach. The, um, the remarks that you made in, 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 in respect to uh, the future, I think are, are important. The, the presently, 40% of the world's population is under the age of 25 and come 2030, half or more of the world's population will be under the age of 25. And that basically we have to ask ourselves between the United States and China and the rest of the world, what are we handing them? What kind of world are we handing them? A broken world with, with conflicted ideologies or are we going to bequeath to them as they are already the, the, the taking the, the hold of, of, of opportunities in, in the ways that they manage internet communications, collaborations among themselves in a global way that's never been before? We can be optimistic about this. What we need to do is a little bit get out of the way. We need to be able to encourage um, youth empowerment for the 21st century. And, and of course, that China has plenty of youth to offer <laughs> as well. Other nations, and I think that, that, that in America, this in, will uh, election may indeed open up opportunities for youth to see themselves as global citizens in a connected world. And you've mapped out that these interests and combinations of, of collaboration are quite possible and feasible. Uh, so I thank you for your comments and uh, appreciate the, the good spirit in which you brought them. Um, we'll definitely look to, to include you in moving forward in developing Burlingame principles of the 21st century. Thank you very much, Dr. Quill. Thank you, Walter. Nice to be with you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Good afternoon, I'm Dr. Walter Christman, the chairman and co-founder of the Global Challenges Forum Foundation. Um, we're here today with Dr. John Samuel in Delhi, India. Uh, John is the former postmaster general of India. Uh, he was the co-signatory and host of the Global Challenges Forum event in Geneva on the, I'm sorry, in Delhi, on the occasion of the 150th anniversary of the birth of Mahatma Gandhi that led to the Delhi Proclamation and the launch of One Million Youth Leaders for Sustainable Development Beyond 2030. Um, he was a United Nations consultant uh, in support of good governance and uh, very much welcome to his insights on Dr. Abu Ghazala's open letter, the, the uh, Global Partnership Declaration, uh, as it all supports sustainable development. And with that, John, I turn it over to you. Good evening. The world is facing an unprecedented crisis in the form of COVID-19. Faced with the consequences of the global pandemic, we have a rare but narrow window of opportunity to reflect, reimagine, and rebuild the nations of this world. India, a nation of 1.3 billion people, a large nation, a large democracy and the people who have a keen desire to work towards peace and prosperity of the nation and the world. In fact, uh, in 2018, on the occasion of the 150th anniversary of Mahatma Gandhiji's birth, the Global Challenges Forum Foundation as well as the UNITAR we convened the Global Resilience Conference on Integrated Learning and Leader Development. The conference built upon a series of previous workshops and strategic dialogues in the United States, Europe, and the Middle East that have identified key challenges and pointed towards collectively owned opportunities. I would say the culmination of the conference was the Delhi Proclamation in the spirit of the Geneva Declaration 
and the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. From the Delhi proclamation, we came up with 1 million youth leaders for the global sustainable development. 1 million youth leaders to be developed. This is not an easy task, but we felt that in the next 10 years, Global Challenges Forum, as well as people who are in Delhi, India, we should focus upon building 1 million youth leaders for the sustainable development. That too, this was realized on the Mahatma Gandhiji's 150th birth anniversary. We are all aware Mahatma Gandhi is the father of the nation. His words still inspire us to change the world by changing ourselves. He said, in a gentle way, you can shake the world. In fact, he's known for his uh, non-violent methods. He said the weak can never forgive. Forgiveness is the attitude, attribute of the strong. An apostle of non-violence, he taught many things for the leaders of India. And today when we talk about raising 1 million youth leaders across the world in the next 10 years. What we really want to focus is on building young leaders who have a real passion. The United Nations has set a global target as a part of the Sustainable Development Goals to end hunger by 2030. And it also says that currently we are far from reaching this target. Whether it is the goal of ending hunger or ending poverty. These are areas where we want the entire nation to rally behind the UN Sustainable Development Goals. We want to develop the youth of the world in terms of their competence, confidence, connection, compassion and character. This time I would like to refer one of the books written by Darren and James Robinson, Why Nations Fail. In the book, both Darren and James, they point out that nations fail when leaders fail. Nations fail when institutions fail. That's the reason 1 million youth leaders who will be able to stand up for the right values who will be able to build the nations of the world. The world needs more noble leaders growing up to lead the parliaments, legislatures, the governments, our boardrooms, our courtrooms, our universities, the United Nations. The world needs more noble leaders to tackle the pressing problems we face, poverty and ignorance, disease and climate change, intolerance and violent behavior. I see boys and girls who are going to win elections, various awards in science, arts and sports. I see leaders from India and across the world who will inspire people all around the world. And especially when we face this COVID-19 crisis, I would say, Global crisis like this calls for a global solidarity. We need to work together. Unless we work together as leaders, as states, as governments, as nations, we will not be able to solve the key problems that are being faced across the world. I like the words of Edmund Burke who says, all that is necessary for the triumph of evil is that good men do nothing. We want to raise a large number of young people who are good men at the same time who would like to do something so that there is peace, progress and prosperity across the world.
my vision is to be actively involved in nation building that will lead nations to cooperate with one another for the purpose of global development in achieving the goals of peace progress and prosperity well it was in 2000 the united nations led the way in establishing the millennium development goals and this was followed by the sustainable development goals in 2015 which are today the world's main framework for advancing this agenda the un remains a highly influential institution more importantly it embodies the best of humanity the belief that all people deserve basic dignity and that working together is the only way to deliver it that's the only reason global challenges forum has been working with the united nations to achieve the goals especially the sustainable development goals we stand with the unitar to develop people to train young leaders a large number of leaders across the world and especially when i speak from india we where we have a population of 1.3 billion people where we have a demographic dividend where there are a large number of young people we want to develop them so that these leaders are developed in terms of their knowledge skills and attitude that the nation can be developed and accordingly the whole nations will be benefited i really appreciate nelson mandela a man who is a well-known leader across the world he says there's no passion to be playing to be found playing small in settling for a life that is less than the one you are capable of living few images in history are more powerful than that of nelson mandela 27 years he was imprisoned but when he came out he sought remembrance rather than revenge forgiveness rather than hatred in responses to the injustices under apartheid world that's the reason today we talk about cooperation we talk about forgiveness we talk about working together in, even though we may have differences between countries but for the sake of building the whole world we want to work together so the global crisis like covid 19 calls for a global cooperation global solidarity and not only that the global crisis also calls for a global strategy we need to identify as to how we can build the whole world how the nations can come together strategize together so that we'll be able to see a better world where there is no hunger where there is no poverty where there is no exploitation where there is no climate change issues these are the things we really want to change we want to bring a transformation so we want to develop a strategy and especially speaking from india i would say we would like to focus upon development of education we want to see that every child in india is fully educated not only in india but across the world everyone should be fully educated and secondly health care everyone should get the best health care facilities so that they are able to live in a healthy manner so in india we have been focusing a lot on the area of education health care and livelihood so when we develop a large number of young leaders across india and around the world we would like to see that the nations are totally different a better world is possible i would say i strongly believe that a better india is possible 
when you have a burning passion inside you to bring the transformation to the nation, this is absolutely possible. You can make a difference. I'd like to conclude with the words of Dr. Abdul Kalam, who was the former president of India. He says, where there is righteousness in the heart, there is beauty in character. Where there is beauty in character, there is harmony in the home. Where there is harmony in the home, there is order in the nation. Where there is order in the nation, there is peace in the world. That's my vision. That's my dream for the world. That we will work towards a nation. We will work towards a global system where there is peace, progress and prosperity. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Samuel. I, I would like to, to especially thank you for adding India's voice to the call, Dr. Abu Ghazala, in the Global Partnership Declaration for all nations to join in a shareable common vision. His open letter to America and China is written in the aftermath of the American presidential election in a, in a state of deep contention between those two nations and an urgent call for them to identify what are the shared values that those two nations hold in common with the rest of mankind. And your speech there on behalf of bringing India's voice has articulated very well, not only what India holds dear, but what all of humanity holds dear and can hold in common. So thank you for, for bringing that voice uh, in support. I would also endorse the, your emphasis on the United Nations 17 Sustainable Development Goals. Uh, it's important to note that the 17th Sustainable Development Goal 